This uh, paper that I'm going to present is a chapter from my PhD thesis. It's actually a condensed version of that chapter. Um, and so if it feels like a little bit of a, a sort of a deep dive, then hopefully in the Q&A time we can sort of talk about some of the broader themes and, and develop it a little bit more. Um, but for now, oh, and also probably good to say, obviously, this is maybe kind of obvious, but uh, we're dealing with the book of Judges. So if at points this feels a little bit weighty and heavy, I, I do apologize. But hopefully it's worth it and uh, we can get through that and get to a happy a happy ending, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> so, throughout the narratives of the Hebrew Bible, vows serve as a literary convention employed by biblical authors to increase or relieve plot tension, highlight the import or irony of a given interaction, reveal characters' unseen motivations, and distinguish heroes and heroines from their less than noble counterparts. Jephthah's vow brings his own story and the wider plot of Judges to an unexpected and agonizing climax, while simultaneously exposing the faithlessness not only of the judge himself, but of the entire nation of Israel. A predominant symptom of Israel's departure from following Yahweh and their subsequent depravity is the violent dehumanization of female characters throughout the book of Judges. This ugly motif is catalyzed by the slaughter of Jephthah's daughter and culminates in the dismemberment of the concubine and the kidnapping and forced marriage of 400 virgins and the daughters of Shiloh at the conclusion of the book. These stories are challenging to read, and yet it is interesting to consider the treatment of female characters in the book of Judges as a symptom of Israel's relationship to Yahweh. At the outset of the narrative, stories like that of Aksa and Yael depict a nation that is still tethered, albeit loosely, to Yahweh and in which female characters function with relative autonomy and leadership. As the narrative progresses and with the fulfillment of Jephthah's vow, the book's plot takes a downward turn and each successive story featuring a female character depicts a sore lack of dignity or justice for women in Israel. These two themes progress hand in hand with Israel's increasing departure from Yahweh and his instruction. Female characters in the book of Judges become pawns at best, commodities at worst. Jephthah's tragic vow and the subsequent sacrifice of his daughter mark a definitive turning point in the overall trajectory of this theme. So the following chart illustrates this progression. Get out of the way a little bit here. And just, to, just a quick caveat, in my chapter, because I did have more space, I was able to go into each of these stories uh, and explore them in detail. So if any of these stand out to you and you want to circle back to them in the Q&A time, we can do that. The narrative decline from Axa's boldness, Deborah's leadership, and Yael's victory to the violent rape and death of the concubine and the theft and exchange of hundreds of equally nameless Israelite women is as significant as it is steep. Jephthah's problematic vow plays a pivotal role in this sequence. Prior to the death of his daughter, four powerful women play key roles, three of whom secure Israel's victory and peace amidst warfare. Following the fulfillment of Jephthah's fateful vow, four more women appear, all of whom bear some connection to the impetuous judge, Samson. Indeed, Samson's legacy is intertwined with the women who define him and ultimately prove to be his undoing. These women's narratives are complicated. Samson's mother is confided in twice by the angel of Yahweh and yet remains nameless and overlooked by her husband. Samson's wife and the prostitute in Gaza feature as pawns, nameless and caught in the throes of an egotistical battle between Samson and his rivals. Delilah, the last female character to be named in the book of Judges, provides a brief, albeit controversial, reprieve from the suppression of female agency in the book of Judges. Like Yael, Delilah lulls a warrior to sleep, plotting his demise all the while. It is at her hand that the Philistines secure a victory over the seemingly invincible judge. Crucially, Delilah's allegiance is not to Israel, nor is that of the men who, much like Israel did in the case of Yael, benefit from her victory. 
Israel's enemies succeed then because they do what Israel has increasingly failed to do since the death of Jephthah's daughter, afford agency to their female counterparts. Indeed, both autonomy and dignity are increasingly stripped from female characters as the narrative pro progresses from this point, a fact that is never more apparent than in the final four stories of Israelite women in the book of Judges. All four of these groups of women are unnamed and, apart from Micah's mother, are brutally dehumanized at the hands of Israelite men. The Jephthah narrative occurs at the center of the book of Judges and marks a definitive turning point amidst the sequence of stories outlined here. It is framed on either side by mirrored accounts of the judges who precede and follow Jephthah's rule, both of whom are memorable not because of their deeds, but because of the rate at which they proliferate. Prior to Jephthah's arrival on the scene, Yair the Gileadite makes a brief appearance. Though he is said to have judged Israel for 22 years, no mention is made of his conquests uh, or how he came to be Israel's judge. Indeed, the number of his sons and uh, their donkeys, 30 in all, is all the information provided, along with the fact that his sons possess 30 cities. This account is both concise and odd and makes little sense until it is considered in conjunction with the judge whose rule directly follows Jephthah's, Ibzan of Bethlehem, with his 30 sons and 30 daughters. Again, the number of his offspring is deemed the only detail worth sharing about Ibzan, though he judged Israel for seven years. Indeed, the significance of both accounts lies more in the tidy framework that they create around the pivotal story of Jephthah than in any particular contribution that either judge made during his time in power. The mirrored descriptions of Yair and Ibzan and their extensive families serve primarily to draw attention to what or whom comes between. The memorable detail of each judge's 30 sons catches the reader's attention both before and after the Jephthah story and creates an inclusio that further highlights the centrality of Jephthah's vow for the book's plot as a whole. Much has been stated and debated about the motivation behind Jephthah's vow. Certainly the obscurity behind this detail as an intentional literary technique creates tension and drama at this climactic moment in the book's plot. And perhaps this is the point, as the people of Israel continue to do that which is, quote, right in their own eyes, end quote, Yahweh's oversight fades into the background and the characters are left to fend for themselves in their definition of good from bad. Nevertheless, there are clues, subtle as they may be, as to the integrity or lack thereof, of Jephthah's actions. To begin with, his response to the spirit of Yahweh is unusual. Second, the uniquely long apodosis or promise of his vow troubles the notion that Jephthah made his pledge unthinkingly. In addition to this, the grief conjured up by the text surrounding his daughter's death is palpable. And finally, the progression of Jephthah's rule following the fulfillment of his vow is telling. Each of these understated cues combine to cast Jephthah in a less than favorable light. The spirit of Yahweh is said to descend on Jephthah prior to his conquest of the Ammonites. In chapter 11, verse 29, Jephthah is not the only recipient of this empowering presence. Othniel, an earlier judge, is equally equipped prior to a battle with the king of Mesopotamia. Gideon is supplied, literally clothed with the spirit prior to conquering Israel's enemies in the valley of Jezreel. Samson receives the same help against the Philistines and Saul, facing the same enemy as Jephthah, the Ammonite forces, is descended upon by the spirit of Yahweh. Jephthah's response to this aid, however, is different from that of each of these other warriors apart from Gideon. We can come back to that. While they move swiftly to victory, Jephthah stops to bargain. The spirit of Yahweh comes upon Jephthah, an instant clue of his imminent success. And in the next verse, he utters his vow in an, in an attempt to strike a deal with Yahweh and secure his support. The ambiguous terms of Jephthah's vow aside, this is a strange move. The help of the spirit usually acts as a linchpin in any dispute, no matter how formidable. Still, 
Jephthah's tendency as the rejected son of a sex worker surrounded by a motley crew of criminals to assure his own welfare by means of haggling has already been demonstrated. When approached by the elders of Gilead who promised to instate him as their leader following his victory over the Ammonites, Jephthah is not content to take them at their word. Rather, he insists that the elders confirm their promise to give him leadership over their people three times before he is content to fight on their behalf. Needless to say, this tendency to bargain, particularly when it comes to negotiating with Yahweh, casts doubt on Jephthah's integrity as Israel's judge. In addition to this, it is worth noting the uniquely lengthy apodosis or promise contained in Jephthah's vow, which includes the first third, and fourth elements of the votive formula defined by Cartledge in his monograph on vows in the Hebrew Bible and the ancient Near East. To begin with, the surrounding narrative provides us with the context from which this promise is motivated, or the vow is motivated, which is the first characteristic. <clears throat> Jephthah prepares to lead Israel into battle against the Ammonites and calls out to God for help. Although the introductory material informs the reader that Jephthah calls out to Yahweh, the judge does not explicitly address the deity in his vow, which would be the second characteristic. On the condition that God grants him victory over the Ammonites, which is the, the protesis, Jephthah promises to sacrifice the first thing to meet him upon his return home, which is the promise. Cartledge organizes each part of his vow, as you see here. The apodosis or promise of this particular vow is lengthy, yet Jephthah's promise is clearly stated in the fact that he will sacrifice what or whomever is first to welcome him home. The details provided in the additional clauses simply concern when and how this promise will be fulfilled. It is ironic, however, that the apodosis of Jephthah's vow is generally considered to be evidence of a lapse of judgment on the judge's part despite the fact that it is one of the longest and most specific of all votive apodices uh, in the narrative of the Hebrew Bible. Indeed, Jephthah mentions the doors of his home as the specific context, his return from battle as the particular time frame, and burnt offering as the designated method for his vow to be fulfilled. Whether or not the judge had any notion of how his vow would ultimately be enacted, the specificity of this final element of the votive formula complicates the idea that Jephthah did not think through the terms of his vow. Not only are the terms of his vow troublingly precise, but the details provided in the fulfillment of Jephthah's pledge cast a gloomy shadow over his victory. Upon the judge's return from battle and the emergence of his daughter at the head of a celebratory procession, the pace of the narrative slows down considerably, further highlighting the painful interactions between father and daughter. To begin with, the text provides background information. This daughter is Jephthah's only child. This information combined with Jephthah's agonized outcry lead the reader to believe that she is particularly loved by her father. Jephthah explains his vow to her, and his daughter's response only underlines the anguish of this moment. Rather than fighting or fleeing, Jephthah's daughter accepts her fate as the victim of Jephthah's fateful vow, but requests the right to spend two months in mourning, roaming the mountains with her companions. The shift of narrative attention from Jephthah and his conquest to his daughter and her prolonged period of lamentation is significant. The focal point of this story is no longer the judge's victory, but the tragedy of his daughter's unnecessary death. Without explicitly condemning Jephthah's vow, whether through the mouth of a fellow character or Yahweh himself, the text portrays its fulfillment in a mournful rather than in approving tones. Finally, the trajectory of Jephthah's rule from this point onwards is not a positive one. Immediately following the sacrifice of his daughter, Jephthah is caught up in civil warfare and leads the men of Gilead to slaughter tens of thousands of their Ephraimite brothers. This self-destructive cycle has occurred before in chapters 8 and 9, and it will occur again in chapters 20 and 21. 
The mass murder of fellow Israelites by their own people is never a good sign, indicating instead the drastic departure of the nation from Yahweh's oversight. Indeed, the book of Judges ends on this sordid note with a long and gruesome account of the near obliteration of one tribe at the hands of their Israelite brothers. These concluding narratives depict an Israel that is blinded by their own definition of what is good and glutted on their own immorality. The brief but somber account of civil conflict at the end of the Jephthah account foreshadows this later catastrophe and places Jephthah in the ignoble company of Israel's leaders who incite bloodshed amongst their own people. It is important to note that prior to his vow, Jephthah's career as Israel's judge, albeit brief, was hopeful. Despite bartering the conditions of his leadership with the elders of Gilead, Jephthah proceeds to confront the king of the Ammonite forces with an account of Yahweh's direction and provision for the people of Israel. This, in combination with the subsequent matter of the spirit of Yahweh imbuing Jephthah as he embarks for battle, are entirely in his favor. The tables are turned, however, the moment that the judge utters his unnecessary and ruinous vow. Jephthah's victory is mentioned succinctly, but it is the repercussions of his vow on the life of his daughter and the disastrous end of his rule that predominate the remainder of his account. Not only does Jephthah's vow function as a pivotal moment in the narrative of the judge himself, but it operates as a turning point at the book's most climactic moment from which the narrative plunges downhill through repeated accounts of Israel's waywardness. This downward spiral is foreshadowed by Jephthah's vow and exemplified in part by the ongoing and prolific acts of violence against female characters throughout the remainder of the book. Further emphasis is placed on Jephthah's vow as a turning point in the treatment of female characters by informative connections between this story and those at the outset and conclusion of the book of Judges. The broad allusions between Jephthah and his daughter and Caleb and Aksa at the very beginning of the book in chapter 1 position them in stark contrast to each other. A father makes a promise. In Caleb's case, this is not an emphatic statement, an oath or a vow, but simply a spoken agreement. Both men offer up their daughters on the condition of victory, Aksa as a wife, Jephthah's daughter as a sacrifice, and both daughters subsequently make a request of their fathers. Though the parameters of each story are remarkably similar, their conclusions diverge drastically. Aksa approaches her father with apparent confidence and asks, almost demands, a profitable inheritance of land, while Jephthah's daughter, facing the prospect of an early and cruel death at the hands of her father, asks instead for the opportunity to grieve her virginity. The stark difference between the fate of these two women highlights the deterioration of female agency thus far and anticipates the continual disintegration of all dignity afforded to female characters throughout the remainder of the book. Not only this, but details from the Jephthah narrative are also woven into the book's final stories, particularly the account of the women taken as wives for the surviving Benjamites. In both cases, a vow or oath is made prior to war. Following the ensuing battles, the repercussions of each pledge are realized and ultimately lead to violence against women. Alongside broad thematic similarities, Wong identifies shared language between the two texts, key vocabulary used to describe Jephthah's daughter, Bat and Betulim, uh, and Lo Yada Ish, is picked up and reused to depict the daughters of Yabesh Gilead and the virgins of Shiloh. In addition, Jephthah's daughter dances Mahalot to meet her father before her untimely death. The women of Shiloh similarly dance, Mehalot, unaware of the fate that awaits them. The significance of these allusions, according to Wong, is to reveal that the quote-unquote bizarre behavior of the final stories of judges have precedent in the earlier judge cycles. I would add to this interpretation a more specific purpose for the echoes of Jephthah's daughter and her fate. These final dismal scenes hearken back to the fulfillment of Jephthah's vow, which served as a tragic turning point for female characters in the book of Judges. 
Alongside these informative connections, it is worth considering Jephthah's daughter's response to her father's vow as an element of foreshadowing on the ensuing stories. Given her role as victim in this account, it is perhaps surprising that Jephthah's daughter is given the chance to speak at all, let alone to make a request and, as the fulfillment of that appeal, to spend two months in the company of her friends mourning her own untimely death. However, given the import of this particular narrative for the book as a whole, both in terms of Israel's deteriorating morality and, more specifically, the increasing dehumanization of female characters, the response and actions of Jephthah's daughter should not be overlooked. Indeed, the narrative pauses at a critical moment amidst an account of Jephthah's woeful error and provides his daughter with a space to grieve the violence committed against her. In fact, the length of time that she is allowed to mourn, the fact that she does not do so alone but in the company of other women, and the repetition with which this lamentation occurs even after her death suggests a broader significance. Perhaps in the wake of Jephthah's disastrously decisive vow and in anticipation of all that it signifies not only for his daughter but for the female characters still to come, the grief of these women foreshadows the cruel treatment of their sisters at the hands of an obdurate Israel. The establishment of this custom as a yearly ritual amongst the women of Israel only underlines the far-reaching implications of their lament for the narratives to come. The book of Judges can be difficult to read, particularly in light of the dehumanization of female characters that emerges as a reoccurring theme. The reading that I have offered here cannot alleviate the grief that these stories conjure. They are intended to grieve and even to horrify but rather lends meaning to the suffering of these female characters, which might at first appear entirely meaningless. The book of Judges plays out the theme of Israel's waywardness to its most bitter end, a theme that finds its origin in Genesis 3, with humanity's choice to define for themselves good from bad. It is as an extension of this theme that Israel insists upon doing that which is, quote, right in their own eyes, end quote in the book of Judges, and not surprisingly, a direct fulfillment of the curse that results. Female characters are increasingly suppressed and dehumanized, ruled over by their male counterparts. The book of Judges exemplifies the re repercussions of Israel's departure from Yahweh's instruction, a departure that is never more clear than in the fulfillment of Jephthah's vow and the deterioration of female agency that unfolds thereafter. Yes, absolutely, yes. Yeah, I think um, we have stories uh, throughout, I mean, throughout the Hebrew Bible of characters like Ruth, uh, Hannah, Abigail, uh, Deborah, so many uh, where there's agency afforded and we see them step into a powerful role that is definitive not just for them as a character, but ends up being definitive for the people of Israel. Um, but then so often throughout the throughout the Hebrew Bible we see hand in hand not just in the book of Judges but that when women are mistreated when women are overlooked uh, that it, it that it is a reflection in the same way on on Israel's uh, following after Yahweh and so I think I think actually you know referring back to um, Andy Teachers talk this morning, this is a way, this is a crucial way actually to read Genesis 1 through 3 throughout the whole rest of the Hebrew Bible, throughout the whole rest of scripture, because it's there that we see both God uh, 
setting up and defining the roles that he, uh, that he, the equal roles that he places man and woman into, creates them to flourish in. And then it's with uh, the curse in Genesis 3, the first time we encounter this idea that there might be a ruling over, a suppression of. And so I would argue that if you read that, as Andy suggested this morning, as, as sort of definitive for everything that's to come, then any time we encounter uh, a woman in a position of power, we see, you know, um, like Deborah or Ruth, there's sort of uh, this breath of fresh air, like, oh, we're seeing how it's supposed to be. And in the moments, like in the book of Judges, where we see the exact opposite, I think what makes these books so difficult to read is when we come to them and we think, what do I do with this? What does this say about the God of Israel? Is this supposed to be in some way prescriptive for following him? How do I reconcile these things? But if we understand that this is exactly the opposite, this is a, this is a portrayal of Israel wandering and departing from and living out the curse, then that revolutionizes the way that, that we read those texts um, and how they, they affect us. Was that Boaz's? Boaz. Boaz's vow. Um, yeah, I think. Uh, sorry, I'm thinking through that question. <laughs> There's a lot of places we could go. I mean, I think. So sorry, I'm just going to go off on my own little because you brought up Ruth. <laughs> so I didn't talk about this, but my PhD thesis was on vows and oaths in the Hebrew Bible. So I think in the Book of Ruth, if I can just go there, the most important oath is Ruth's. <laughs> so, <laughs> in chapter one, we all know Ruth makes this, this statement that, I mean, we know it because it's so beautiful, it's so powerful, where she says, I'll leave my people, I'll leave my land, I'm going with you, your people will be my people, your God will be my God, I will, where you're buried, I will be buried. And uh, it's this powerful moment where she stands out as this character who, uh, who is, actually, I would argue, more aware than, than Naomi in that moment of, of Yahweh and his, and his oversight and more willing and ready to follow him. And Boaz, I think, plays a very important role, but I would argue that Ruth's role is more important. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's it's the, the so yeah the the rule those laws uh, about vows and as also in, um, in numbers five I think it is uh, where the there's the laws about uh, uh, if a woman makes uh, a vow or an oath and she speaks rashly then her father can can sort of cancel it by the end of the day. There's a lot of, um, in the legal um, material, there's a lot of pieces that are very important to read, I think, in conjunction, in conjunction with the narratives. So for example, of, of Hebrew Bible, um, because often the, the laws are sort of played out and, and often even um, there's some context added to them when we read uh, how they're played out in the story. So for example, that law about, uh, uh, if a woman makes a rash vow, her, her basically a man can cancel it by the end of the day. Um, is interesting when we come to First Samuel 25 uh, through 20, 25, where Abigail David speaks this really rash oath. He's about to go kill Nabal, and uh, Abigail is the one who comes and meets him, and she speaks a counter oath to his and stops him in his tracks. Um, so that is a moment where we see a law that we read. If we read it at face value, it seems. Um, in a sense, to put uh, women at a disadvantage, at, that their their vows can be uh, sort of cancelled by the man in authority over them. But then when we read in the narratives, we see that being troubled and complicated. So I think it's important to read those this way. And I think much the same with Jephthah's vow and the idea of dedicating, uh, dedicating people to... I mean, even... So this reading the story of Jephthah 
And then thinking about Saul in 1 Samuel 14 when he's going uh, to battle and he uh, makes an oath that ends up putting Jonathan's life on the line. Um, and the people, the, the soldiers around him cry out and counter his oath with their own and say, far be it from you to do this thing. And uh, he, he doesn't follow through. Jonathan isn't sacrificed. And so some commentators and scholars would gesture to that passage and suggest that Jephthah had similar options, that he didn't need to follow through, um, that he could have, in fact, um, in Targum Jonathan, I think it is, uh, it says that if Jephthah had gone to the priest, uh, Phineas, at the time, that uh, he could have negotiated and substituted an animal sacrifice in this instance. So there's definitely space, room for the idea that Jephthah didn't need to follow through in the way that he did, but maybe if we back it up, he didn't need to make the vow in the first place. So. 